Thank you very much. So it was last month where it was the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. It was invented in Geneva, not that far from here, by Tim Berners-Lee, and it did something very, very important for our world. It connected information. It made information interconnected between two things. And the important thing it did, it basically paved the way towards digitalizing knowledge as we know today. And then something different came around. We had the computer or the personal computer. And a personal computer essentially gave us access to that knowledge database. So suddenly, through the World Wide Web and the internet combined, we from our homes could access that insane amount of information and basically look everything up. And then something in 2007 happened with the introduction of the iPhone, where essentially that whole wisdom and that whole knowledge started to become accessible to the palm of our hands wherever we are, whenever we want, and we did amazing things with it amongst also not so amazing things. But the core aspect that happened for us people is essentially we had to start to learn to think digital. So how can we transform our current services and businesses to become more digital and to adjust to that World Wide Web? Facebook came along and they essentially digitalized social networks, our social fabric, our society in that sense, or at least that was the attempt. Amazon started to digitalize retail. Google started to say, you know what? I'm going to have to make that whole pool of information searchable. So this was the important step for us humans. How can we actually digitalize us and our society? Now, the question is, what's next? What's that step after that? How can we transform into the next stage? And the next stage is about making that information and making machines available to the world, and making, vice versa, the world around us available to those machines. So essentially, connect the world around us and machines. At that moment, something, in my opinion, even more magical happens. At that moment, the world around us becomes the new user interface. So at that very moment, the digital world and us humans, which live in the physical world, basically share that same infrastructure. We share that same user interface. And that's what's described as the fourth digital revolution. And we already see the first applications of that. And that's the sign for me that we're knocking on that door of that fourth industrial revolution. With augmented reality, which essentially is the bet that becomes that display of that fourth industrial revolution, where digital content starts to become accessible wherever you are, wherever you want, and you don't need to have a screen anymore. You can suddenly have a hologram next to you, and you can suddenly interact with the world around you in a digital manner. Another example of that next wave is our autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are essentially cars which are driven without any human interface, and they're driving with other humans on the road. They're interacting with that road, with that world around us, completely autonomously, without any of our input. So they have to understand it. So suddenly, we and machines and we and digital content share the same space. Now if we ask ourselves the question, if the World Wide Web was the infrastructure needed for the third digital revolution, and the third industrial revolution, which was the digital revolution, what is the interface which is needed for the fourth industrial revolution, which is about connecting the digital and the physical world? And that's what slowly starts to emerge as the term of having the world machine readable. Essentially creating that framework and the world of a mirror world starts to pop up. And that's the solution to that machine readable world. So what is a mirror world? A mirror world essentially is digitalization of the world around us. It's a one-on-one -on -one copy of the world we live in. It starts with a 3D model. It starts with the contextual information. It starts with the dynamic elements, such as pedestrian data, such as traffic information, such as energy consumption of a house. It essentially starts to take everything we know about the world we live in, 
that we can somehow put in a digital form and assemble that together. That's essentially what the mirror world is. And there's a second term which starts to pop up, especially in the IoT industry, which is the, which is the word or the term of a digital twin, which was invented by General Electric. And a digital twin is that smallest unit of that mirror world. And a digital twin is nothing else than the representation of a single object or a single process in a digital form. Now, when we start to think about mirror worlds and how can we actually start to create that, that framework for the fourth industrial revolution, we identified three key factors. The first factor is the base layer for this is three-dimensional. Our world is three-dimensional. And it's not just three-dimensional, it also has a component of time. Because our world changes over time, and we want to have a record of that. So it's not just 3D. The second part is, it needs to be complete. If you have a mirror world with just a couple of cities, it's vastly less interesting than you have a mirror world of the 100 largest cities, or eventually of the whole planet, because it becomes ubiquitously available. And then you have the third element, which is in order for that mirror world to be machine readable, everything needs to be contextualized in the first place. You need to know this is a house, you need to know this is a car, you need to know this is a traffic sign, you need to know this is a tree. Only then that mirror world becomes understandable to machines in the first place. But it also needs to be well structured because not every application needs the same mirror world. So sometimes you just want to have pedestrian data and weather data and maybe the 3D data. And sometimes the 3D data alone is, is enough. So for this, you need to be able to accommodate if you want to generate that infrastructure layer. So it needs to be well-structured and it needs to be contextual. Now, if you look at this, most people would probably think that this is a photo, but it's a 3D model. And it's a rendering of a, of a district we took in Zurich. And that it's really a 3D model, I give you a quick run through here where you start to interact with that 3D model. And that essentially builds the base layer for that mirror world. So suddenly we have photorealistic 3D environments available which build that base layer for that mirror world. But those 3D models <coughs> are not just visual and they, they have the whole geometry and the whole texture within them, but they're also segmented. So in a different example, that shows you that segmentation. So within that, every house, every car, every tree becomes a known identity, and then you can start to take them away. And at that very moment, you have a completely modular world, and you can recombine that at your needs. And maybe you don't even need the buildings. Maybe the roads are just good enough for you. And maybe you just need one single building, and maybe you want to take that single building and create something completely new around it. And then we come to the smallest unit, back to the digital twin. So the digital twin within our mirror worlds are essentially those units where now you can start to add information about that fire hydrant. But not only that, an artist can take that and use that as a digital asset in order to create his game or her game and create new experiences around it. Now, if we say the mirror world is the infrastructure for the fourth industrial revolution, we maybe can take a step back and look, what are the lessons learned about the World Wide Web if you already build such an infrastructure again? And the World Wide Web was built with that open spirit and yet created those massive monopolies. And maybe we don't want that this time around. And the first part is we need to talk about data ownership. So if I contribute my data, doesn't matter if I'm a government, if I'm a company, if I'm an individual, to that mirror world, I want to maintain owner of that data. And that data ownership is very, very important because that gives me the control over shared business models, that I can participate in the revenues of that data. Imagine you would have a little, 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 tiny, little bit of Facebook's revenue because you own that data. The only thing you get back today is that you can use the service for free. That completely changes the narrative. And we're now today rebuilding that infrastructure with that narrative in mind. But if you want to control data ownership, you also need to control who is actually accessing this data, because maybe I want to share that data only within people of that same country. Or maybe I want to share that data only within people of my social surrounding. So I need to know who's accessing that data in the first place. 
And then we have the topic of data privacy. So if you want to have data ownership and all of that linked, you need to talk about data privacy and you need to have the option to keep your data completely confidential and private if you want. And the last part is governance. And governance is something which the digital world really struggled with in the past. And we're always struggling also today with that. Should we regulate the internet or not? Should we regulate what content comes on those platforms or not? But now the situation is a little bit different because the applications which run on the mirror world, they run in the world that we live in. So they interact with the legal system that we are in. So at that very moment, you have to start to ask the question, how are the boundaries between the physical world we live in and that mirror world? And what are the boundaries between those two systems? Is one completely unregulated, you can do whatever you want, and is the other one bound by law? But what happens if an autonomous vehicle then goes on the street? In what world is an autonomous vehicle living? To just give you one little brain teaser, this was a, an art piece which was designed. It's an augmented reality art piece, so it doesn't exist in a physical form, and yet it experienced the act of vandalism. Other artists were basically destroying this art piece. Is that allowed? Because in the physical world, it isn't. And this is exactly the brain teaser that starts to happen once you have those two um, worlds merging together. Now when we talk about what are the spatial applications, what are the applications of that mirror world? What are the opportunities that we run into? Imagine if you are someone who needs to find out something about the city, to find out who, what is the highest building in that town. If you want to analyze what rooftop would be the most efficient for solar panels, if you're a company selling solar panels, this is vastly important to you. If you're an autonomous vehicle company, you can start to use that mirror world in order to test your autonomous vehicle instead of testing it on the physical road. Because essentially for a robot, those two worlds are the same thing because they're just interpreting sensor data. And for a government, it gives you the opportunity to introduce scenarios which maybe don't even happen in reality very often or not often enough to train autonomous vehicles, like for instance, snowfall in this example. If you're an architect, you can start to visualize your building and communicate it to your, to your client in a completely different way because you can emerge them and tell them, listen, this is how it's going to look like. They can pass on this information to the construction company. And if you're a gamer, you can start to create a game environment and a new game basically at the push of a button because that whole mirror world is already accessible which is the base layer to create 3D games in the first place. What I want to think, or what I want to inspire you, is basically to start thinking about how is the mirror world and how are the applications which come from that transforming the industry that you are working in? And how is it transforming your life? To start thinking about what would be the spatial application that would be available for my company? How could I build that? And on the other hand, what is the type of data that I could contribute towards that mirror world? Because a lot of companies, they collect a lot of data about spatial processes. And they can start thinking about entering that data into that mirror world and someone else might profit from that data. So what we have to learn when we make the parallel to the World Wide Web is we essentially now have to learn how to think spatial. But the interesting part is that this time we're not alone in this because the machines, they also have to learn to think spatial. Because if the autonomous vehicle doesn't know how to think spatial, it cannot drive on the physical road. And that's why my pledge is that we go together, the machines and humans, and not against each other through that fourth industrial revolution. Thank you very much.